Well, good day everyone everywhere and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Yahshua, Jesus, our Messiah. The name of this broadcast is Cross the Border and I'm Nicholas and this is our Prophecy Reality Edition, a live Wednesday morning. Uh, turn on the studio cam, you can watch it at prophecyrealitytv.net or you can just continue to listen. Uh, to the live firstamendmentradio.com broadcast or podcast or rebroadcast, however you're listening. Uh, let's see. Well, first things first. Let's see. I have a scripture of the week for me. And so I'm going to share that with you. And that is Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And what is your reasonable service? How do you present your bodies a living sacrifice? Uh, verse 2 says it. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Or as the Messiah himself uh, said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Paul here, in other words, is telling you to repent. The same gospel that Jesus preached, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we know that repent, the word repent means to change your mind. And what do you change about your mind about? Well, Paul nails it again right here, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? We change our mind about those things that are not pleasing to our Heavenly Father. We change our mind. We come into an agreement with Him about those things that may be separating from you or those things which His Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are being convicted about. And when you change your mind, it will change your life. It is a very important thing. So there you have it. Romans 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. Oh, what are we going to do today? Well, I have questions and headlines and things like that. I don't really have a prepared two-hour uh, presentation for you, so uh, we're just going to kind of have fun today. Let's see who's in the chat room. Uh, Keith is in the chat room. Um, Keith at UO. Okay, well, I don't know what UO means. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I've seen Keith before. Uh, BW, I believe that's Brett Wade. Uh, we have Charles and, of course, Studio and Step Away. So if uh, you're listening live uh, in the AM Pacific Time on Wednesday or at noon uh, on the other coast, uh, the President Coast, that is, the Washington, D.C. coast, yeah. That would be about noon. You, know, you can join us in the chat room, and you might even we might even take calls later on. So, and I'll put the, the I'll give the number out when I'm ready to take calls. Uh, well, I'll take first of all. I'm gonna look at some questions that I have in my email box here. Let's see, um, <laughs> okay, questions for prophecy live. Let me back up here. See. Um, uh, Robert, oh, Robert Butler, he says, I received a copy of your new book, Fist Footsteps of Mystery Babylon. I'm enjoying it. As you mentioned in bro the broadcast, I would like to check out the link for rules interpreting prophecy you mentioned. Oh, yes, I, I sent him some rules, but I think they're the wrong ones because I have uh, methods of interpretation is what we were talking about recently, and uh, that was a few broadcasts ago, so you can collect, you can, uh, Go to my website and look that up um, if you're interested in methods of interpretation. But I think he was referring to an older rebroadcast uh, where we interpret the symbols of uh, the prophetic uh, scriptures uh, such as Daniel and Revelation. And so there, but you know, there are no, really no rules. Uh, since scripture interprets itself, we really need to look to the scripture for the interpretation of uh, symbols, you know, it's like the symbols of the beasts. The beasts have a body, and then they have a head, and then they have a horn, and then they have crowns on their horns. 
Well, if you go back and you allow the scripture to interpret that, you find out that the beast appears first, and then the head, and then the horns, and then the crowns upon the horns. So there's a succession there. Things like that. Uh, kind of rules are, I don't know, uh, really need some examples of rules. And I had a document, and I haven't been able to find that, but I'm going to look for that and perhaps spend a whole day just on rules for interpretation of the symbols in prophecy. Well, let me put that on my list of 101 things to do. <laughs> no, it's, it's kind of a serious thing, though. Um, and, and we've gone through some things, how to interpret prophecy. Like, I think in one of the last uh, few broadcasts, we went and looked up the word millennium, or thousand years, that was it, in the book of Revelation. And we looked at the Greek word, and then we highlighted the Greek word, and then we saw where that Greek word appeared before in the scripture. Because the argument by some people is that, well, when they look at the Strong's Hebrew, I mean the Strong's Hebrew Greek dictionary, it says undetermined period of time. Well, that's true. If I say thousand, it's an undetermined period of time because I haven't put... Um, a definite article before it, like a thousand, or the thousand, or one thousand, or ten thousand. So if you put the article before it, it's not undetermined anymore. And if I say I'm going to pay you a thousand dollars if you work for me for a week, well that's the same thing as saying I'm going to pay you one thousand dollars for working for me a week. So that's, it's definite. And so that's the way it's used in the Revelation. <coughs> as uh, there's a definite article before it at all times, even if it is the or a thousand, it is definite because the a, the article before it, makes it definite. And if you look up that word thousand in the, in the Strong's Greek Dictionary, it does say undetermined period, uh, indefinite, or something like that. But then if you follow through and you search the use of that term, throughout the whole New Testament, you find out that it is definite and that it is not an undetermined period. Everywhere it's used as a thousand, it literally means a thousand, and if it didn't, it would make no sense whatsoever. So these are rules for interpretation, but you really have to, uh, all I can do is bring forth examples like that, how we interpret. You know, it's like the symbol of uh, the beasts with the heads and the horns. Well, we go back to where the scripture interprets that for us, like, like uh, you know, the Greek Empire. You had, you had uh, Alexander the Great, uh, and so there was a beast that rose up, and it had one notable horn, but the one notable horn was plucked out, and four took its place. So you have a succession there. You move forward uh, on the animal, uh, from the body to the heads to the horns, and then perhaps even crowns. Um, and that's, that's about all you can do as, as far as interpreting is look to the scripture because the scripture does give us plenty of interpretation of symbols and so we just need to look for those symbols. And if I had another, one more example of how we can do that. In uh, Romans chapter 13 we have the second beast that rises up out of the earth. Now sometimes a symbol can be the opposite of another symbol. Because before the second beast, the one that rises up out of the earth, there's a critter or a beast that rises up out of the sea. And, uh, and then you move forward, say, because the scripture does give us an interpretation for the sea, it says that waters are multitudes and nations and tongues and peoples. So we know that the sea represents a, uh, a very populated or densely populated area where the first beast did rise up. So we can verify that because we know the first beast was the Roman Empire and it did rise up in the old world which was densely populated. Um, but the earth beast, so the earth being the opposite because on the earth you have, you have either land which is called earth or you have water which is called sea. So the earth beast could be an opposite. It would be the opposite of a densely populated area. And you find out and there's only one other place in the entire scripture where earth, or well, the entire revelation, I should say, because I'm not sure I've searched the entire scripture, but I was looking for the earth being used as a symbol. 
and I only found one other place in the book of Revelation that was at chapter 12 of the Revelation where earth was being used as a symbol and that uh, the earth swallowed up the flood that the dragon sent after the woman um, by providing a place in the wilderness for the woman. So we have earth being used as a symbol of wilderness there, thus verifying our interpretation at chapter 13 of the earth being the opposite of the water, which is uh, densely populated, so the earth would be therefore wilderness or sparsely populated. These are kind of rules for, I, I would rather call it grammatical, his, a grammatical historical interpretation of the, uh, the scripture because we're looking at the grammar and we also have to pay attention to history. Um, I, I was uh, had a chance to uh, to converse with some historicists and uh, I find that a lot of historicists they accept assumptions which I'm not willing to accept like they they accept the assumption that a day is always a year in prophecy and other people have other assumptions that there are prophetic years but you know I've searched the entire Bible and I can find no prophetic year anywhere a year is a year is a year is a year <laughs> in the Bible and that's all it is is a year and there are no Hebrew years okay now because if you go to my my blog you'll find what year is it for example or you'll find what month is it and what we find out is that over say a hundred years a hundred Hebrew years is approximately uh, almost exactly equivalent to 100 solar years, okay? It's the same thing basically. So I say a year is a year is a year, okay? And uh, all of this nonsense about 360 day or prophetic years or Hebrew years is exactly that, nonsense. Uh, the Hebrews were given a calendar in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt. Uh, uh, the, the Heavenly Father said this shall be the beginning of months to you and he gave them a calendar with Abib or the first month of the year being Abib and Abib was of course the sign that it was the first month and if they got to uh, 12 months pass or 12 moon cycles months pass and it wasn't Abib yet well they had a 13th moon cycle called or a last, uh, another last month called second Adar, because Adar was the last month or the twelfth month. And if it wasn't a Bib yet, they had uh, they had second Adar because they had to wait another moon cycle for a Bib to happen. And so they inserted uh, seven of nineteen years. They inserted an extra moon cycle or an extra month in their year, a second Adar to keep their calendar seasonally correct. So over a period of 19 years, it would be approximately equivalent to 19 solar years because of this correction device that they had built into the calendar that the Creator gave them. So there is no Hebrew year to differentiate from, uh, say, a thousand years on the, uh, uh, you know, on the calendar that we commonly use today because uh, a year is a year. Now some argue that there were 360 day years in the scripture also, and there were. How did we get on this? But we're going to continue on it. Because I just, you know, a lot of the fallacies and assumptions that people need to lay down. That's what we're talking about. Uh, because before the flood, apparently, and you know, the evidence is in the scripture itself, that there were 360 day years. And uh, so they say that we need to count those years. But no, I find something else. The God who gave us all the prophecies of all the years, uh, like 490 years of Daniel, 70 weeks, and other, uh, some, some prophecies are day for years, but they're expressed in different ways to give us a clue. And some are a day for a day prophecy. Uh, that we just have to be able to, uh, I believe that it is expressed in the text when we're supposed to do that. But uh, the 360 days, years, day, days, years prior to the flood, well, something changed in the cosmos so that there was no longer exactly 360 day years any longer. 
but the fact remains that so there was 360 day years before the flood after the flood we had 365 point whatever day years but it doesn't matter because a year is a year if it was a year before the flood we don't correct the years after the flood they're just they're calculated a little different because of changes that took place during the flood and some things were rearranged uh, or adjusted in the cosmos or whatever because God gave them the calendar to deal with those differences in the Exodus. So don't go for the nonsense about 360 day years or Hebrew years and, and people doing these strange calculations like well if we use 360 day years it comes out to and that's what I found with um, and not uh, who was it um, O.H. Grattan Guinea's other books that it didn't like because he gave you all of these different calculations. He had lunar years and solar years and yeah, and it just it got too complicated. It was like multiple choice. Which one do you like best? Well, here's all the choices for you. Uh, nothing definitive. So anyway, as far as interpreting prophecy, I have to interpret a year as a year is a year because God gave the Hebrews a calendar then he gave them prophecies so we have to go by the calendar that he gave them and he did not give them a 360 day year calendar okay well I hope that settles that uh, had no idea where I was going there today but anyway yes they're just talking about rules for interpreting and how some people make hard and fast rules and they should throw some of those rules out uh, look for the rule in the book about whatever it is you're interpreting when you're interpreting it, okay? That's, that's the rule for interpretation. And employ the historical grammatical. It, it's, and grammatical means you look in the text. And uh, God's word is very exacting. Okay.